The way north from Tindrum marks the start of the climb onto Rannach Moor and the famous road to the Isles, and further north to the romantic West Highlands with the misty Isle of Skye and the enchanting Hebrides beyond. The next stop in the busy road north is the hamlet of Bridge of Orkey, with its striking white washed tail. It is also the next stop in the West Highland line as well. This is where the railway line rises steadily away from the A82 and northwards into the wilds of Rannach Moor. The West Highland line and the road to the Isles was voted the best railway journey in the world by a well-known travel magazine, so I went up to see it for myself. In the distance I could see the train approaching from the south. The next stretch is the bleakest part of the line and it is floated across the boggy moor and layers of turf and brushwood. From here, the train climbs gradually up to Carrower on the summit of the moor at 13,040 feet. This trip would give me just over half an hour at Carrower before returning in the next train back. I was surprised at just how busy the train was. The railway station remains one of the most remote in Britain and the nearest public road is almost 10 miles away. And before very long, the train continued on its way to Fort William in the west. There used to be a footbridge at the station, but it was moved to Rannach, and the passengers now cross by a level crossing. Carrower was most famously used in the film Train Spotting. Soon, it was the only one that was left. Well, so much to do and so little time. Where do I go first? <laughs> at the end of the platform, you have two choices, east or west. I decided to see what alternatives the west route offered. To the south was Rannach Moor. There was nothing but moorland ahead, a path to the west, a path to the north and a signpost. The signpost showed Fort William 20 miles to the north, Kinloch leaving 15 miles and Spainbridge also was 15 miles north. God knows what lay ahead in the path to the west. This surely is a remote spot. The station was opened in August 1894. The station house was reopened as a restaurant guest house in 2012 to serve meals to passengers, walkers and climbers. It must be one of the most remote restaurants in the British Isles. In the distance, the low cloud was slowly creeping over the mountain tops. One of the highest and most remote mountains in the area is Ben Alder, made famous in the kidnap novel as being the location of Clooney's Cage, the hiding place of the clan chief Clooney Macpherson. From here, a wide path leads across the moorland to Lachosian and the Crower Hunting Lodge. The restaurant was still shut. The windswept station buildings, the signal box and the sound of the rotating wind turbine was more like something from the wild waste, like a scene from high noon. I was actually running out of time and I headed back to the station and all too soon my connection arrived. When I arrived back at Bridge of Orkey, I headed down to the hotel. This little village dates back to 1751, when the bridge was built as part of one of the many military roads being built in the Highlands in an attempt to control the marauding clans. The road from the station to the old bridge, which crosses the A82 at the hotel, is the old military road, and also the route to the West Highland Way. Now I'm led to believe that this little hamlet qualifies to be called a village because it contains a church. And despite the church's position in the main road, it can be easily missed due to its close proximity to the large hotel. The little whitewashed church was built in its current position as a chapel of ease shortly after the building of Major Caulfield's military road. The hotel only appeared after the current A82 was built in the 1920s. This may be a hamlet or a village with only a station, a hotel and a bunkhouse or a church but there is certainly plenty to do for a weekend break. The West Highland Way takes a more direct route towards Rannoch Moor, zigzagging up by a forest path. In Inverorn is not much more than an estate house and a hotel. Loch Tower was down below and in the far bank is the impressive Black Mount Lodge. I wandered along many short stretches of the West Highland Way on this trip, but this must have been the most beautiful part. I thoroughly enjoyed this stretch of the walk. This old whitewashed coaching inn, a relic from days gone by, has even survived the rerouting of the main road north and is as busy as ever today. It dates back over 300 years to 1708. It was a wonderful spring morning. 
The reflection of the Black Mount was a wonderful appetizer for a wilderness walk in Rannach Moor. The snow-capped peaks ahead make up the mountain range known as the Black Mount, a group of four impressive Monroes standing in this dramatic corner of Rannach Moor. My intention was to walk over to Bar Bridge, which sits in the West Highland Way under the shadow of these impressive mountains. Today it showed its softer side, a scenic wilderness wonderland of Loch and dotted moorland with enchanting pine-clad islands. Anach Moor is a site of scientific interest, 50 square miles of boggy moorland, which posed many problems in the creation of the road, and especially the railway, which had to be floated in brushwood and tons of earth. This was the site of the last major ice field in Scotland, and the moor is the lasting result of it. I followed the track towards the west. The impressive snow-capped peaks of the Black Mount range dominated the horizon ahead. There's a classic mountain walk, the Clachlet Traverse, which takes in the extended range of mountains, including those ahead, and links the Inns of Inveroran and the King's House near Glencoe. There's an excellent account of a slog across the wilderness in the Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped. It describes the moor as a wearier looking desert man never saw. Considering the fact that I was crossing the moor under the optimum conditions, the bog hopping involved became soul destroying, and I was beginning to think a little like the author of Kidnapped. There are quite a few large boulders in the moor, some with trees growing out of them, erratics dating back to the times of the Ice Age. A little further on is Bar Bridge. The insignificant river Bar tumbles down from the Black Mount Massive and becomes a bit of a ravine here. It is an idyllic place to stop for a rest. Whether there was a parapet in the bridge or not, there is none now, and I stopped there to charge my batteries before heading back. Despite its wilderness status, this stretch of the West Highland Way was always a major drover's route between the Highlands and the Lowlands. Caulfield's Road also followed this route, and it was even rebuilt by Telford to become the main road north until 1933. Near the entrance to Glenative, where it meets Rannoch Moor, arrived at a side road to the White Quarries. This is where the West Highland Way from Bar Bridge arrives at Glen Coe, and as the signpost says, it is also the route of an ancient cattle drover's road. On the other side of the glen is the Buachalet of Moor, the great shepherd of Etive, and in the foreground is a much photographed and iconic little whitewashed black rock cottage. I decided to take a closer look. The cottage is available for bookings. There are a total of 10 beds, 8 upstairs and a bunk below. Bring your own sleeping bag. There's a basic kitchen and there's a pump-handled toilet in the coal shed. Water is carried in from the burn at the back of the cottage. All the mud cons. Not bad for £6 a night though. A wonderful place to waken up to in a warm sunny morning. And there is a little restaurant on top of the mountain nearby to take the cable car up to for a full Scottish breakfast. Or if you prefer more of a walk and a refreshment as well, there's a comfortable hotel less than a mile across the road. A wonderful B&B &B for walkers. It would get the award for the best bothy in Britain in TripAdvisor. The roof is kept securely in place by thick wire connected to and held securely by large boulders. Almost directly across the road, and still on the route of the West Highland Way, we arrive at the famous old King's House Hotel. For centuries, this hotel has been a watering hole for travellers, and still is. The hotel was built in the 17th century, and Cumberland's troops were billeted here for a while after the Battle of Culloden, and that's where its name comes from. After that, it reverted to a coaching inn again. Despite its seemingly isolated position, it has always been in the main route north, even away back in the time of the drove roads. The military road too passed here instead of going through Glen Cole, and the West Highland Way still follows the same route. The large square building that was original in can still be identified, and it sits where the wonderful old bridge built by Caulfield crosses the River Etive. It is mentioned that there used to be a large fir tree right outside the door of the public bar and has also said that it stopped many a traveller landing in the river when the fresh air hit them. I couldn't believe my eyes. Deer wandered about freely in the hotel grounds, as if they were pets. A stag, lazed in the heather, oblivious to what was going on round about it. 
a visit to the King's house for a refreshment is thoroughly recommended. Several streams gather together near the King's house at Hale. A narrow single track road turns off the main 82 here as well. This is Glenative and it must not be missed. The glen is guarded by two massive Munroes, the Buachal and Cresham. Not long into the glen, we find a wonderful little bucket bridge to allow access to the other side of the river. Riverative seems to be very popular with whitewater kayakers and has many challenging runs, rapids and falls. It actually commands cult status and has graded sections like the Triple Falls, the Crack of Doom and the Great Water Slide thoroughly recommended for clearing the sinuses. A little further on, I came upon a more serene part of the river, where there is a distinct bend in the glen. This was a most beautiful and peaceful scene, and standing dramatically at a corner on the east side was a strange-looking geological feature called Ingrianen. The road then passes the southern access to the Larry Garten, the bialach that separates the two buachos, and eventually takes walkers back to Glencoe. The scenery was starting to get quite dramatic now. I stopped in a lay-by and got out for a better view. The road seemed to have gained some height here. Down in the valley below was Loch Inner, with its pine-clad islands and its banks of rhododendrons. The view, looking back up the glen, is just as impressive. On the way back, I stopped at a couple of places I had missed earlier. Again, the two buachos dominate the return journey, and at the foot of the Larry Garten was a large house, Dalness Lodge, which was owned by the family of Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond, and two or three shots from the film Skyfall were filmed in this glen. As I approached the lodge, I had to stop. I couldn't believe my eyes. The grounds were teeming with deer. Just around the corner, I arrived back at what is probably my favourite view of this unforgettable trip. And before long, I arrived back at the A82. It was time to return to Glencoe again. Ahead were the Three Sisters, one of the most beautiful and striking examples of Scottish scenery at its best. I never tired of this view. I took one final look and headed back for the car. 